So when I talk about the fishes at the Slobber Delta, I'm largely basing a lot of what I say on what I've observed. Uh, for me, like observation of fish, just getting in there, as you can see here, just sitting in a tributary and I'll spend hours like that. And you begin to observe a lot of things. And also when you record stuff on a camera, um, initially you'll watch it three or four times and you see basic behaviors or interactions. But then you'll watch it the sixth time and you'll see a species or a behavior or an interaction that you hadn't seen the first time. Um, and a lot of what I will convey to you are things that have appeared the sixth time I've watched something. So we've had, obviously had quite a lot of interest in, in the, the stingrays. Uh, we've got several species in the Slobra Delta. Uh, we've got uh, Potomotrigon uh, faulkneri. Uh, it's quite difficult to identify because it looks a lot like Pantanensis, although it tends to be uh, a bit smaller. And they are, as all the rays, they really need a high uh, number of crustacea and mollusks in their diet. Uh, if they don't, their teeth can actually overgrow. Um, so you'll find them along the riverbank foraging. And uh, so even you know, early in the morning, I walk down to the riverbank and they're up there sort of shimmying over the, the clay banks because there's lots of holes and gullies and particularly freshwater crabs, which are active at night, will retreat into those holes during the day. And sort of pulse against them with their bodies to create the suction that sucks the animals out. Uh, we chatted earlier a little bit about sort of breeding. On the, uh, the right, you see this specimen here, this female. Um, and I commented to a friend of mine, Heriberto Juvenis Jr., who's from the Environment Agency here, about the chunk that was taken out of her disc. I said, you know, what predator did this? And he said, no, no, this is probably a, a male. The males are really rough with the females, and they will happily bite out chunks of them. So, you know, anyone who's considering breeding large stingrays, not only do you need, you know, uh, a big tank, and if you, you're keeping multiple sexes together, you need to prepare, be prepared for the fact that there's going to be injuries, there's going to be the need to separate individuals, there might be the need for, for uh, treatment. Rays don't respond very well to treatments for infection. So uh, this is another reason that you know, keeping them in, in captivity in anything less than a, uh, a public aquarium or a zoo is perhaps not a great idea. Um, part of that, again, is just the, the space needed. So if this is in a bahia in the dry season, um, all the aquatic vegetation has largely died back. You've got this great big expanse of open sand. And I spent, I think, about an hour just watching various Falkneri swimming back and forth. And the, the Bahia, Bahia was huge. Um, so that the area that they cover, obviously they're doing it in search of food. In captivity, they get the food. But they lose the stimulus. They lose the exercise. They, they lose the dynamics of, of what they would experience in the habitat. Um, and it's one of my things I most enjoy is just observing stingrays in the wild. Uh, we've also got Pantanensis, which looks very similar to Falkneri, but it's a much bigger, uh, sort of chunkier ray. Um, again, we find them uh, foraging along the riverbank. And we've also got famous Potromotrigon motoro, which is very popular amongst ray keepers. Um, it's the largest species in the delta. It's easy to distinguish because it has these orange spots with the the black uh, edging around it. Um, I've seen them mostly in flooded water meadows in the wet season and then in the uh, bahias during the dry season, where, as I said, you know, they hunt for, for uh, mollusks and, and crustacea. They really uh, enjoy the, the apple snails that are so invasive in other parts of the world and here are native. And as we saw earlier, they have this ability to very quickly bury themselves if they feel threatened. Um, and uh, which makes it a problem when you're doing field work, uh, risk treading on them. Um, as you can see on the left here, once they're buried, they sort of disappear uh, very well. Um, I've had instances where I'm, I'm observing other species and I, I look down and centimeters beneath my chest, there's a ray. They're, they're just foraging, they're not really bothered, but uh, it does, uh, does worry me. Um, so it's best to keep a bit of a distance. But again, you can see the kind of habitat, the kind of uh, environment that they would need if kept in captivity is beyond most, uh, most hobbyists. So going on with our Caris forms now, which are our biggest, uh, biggest group here, uh, we've got Carasidium laterali. So quite a few of you might be familiar with Carasidium fasciatum, which is a small dart of Carasin that's beginning to appear much more frequently in the hobby. Uh, laterali is a very small species. It tends to hang out in the midwater column, unlike most uh, Parasidiums that prefer to sit at the bottom. Um, and you can find, find them in normally small groups um, in, in the Slobber Delta, but in the wet season, you'll suddenly find them 
in their thousands and mixed in with lots of other uh, small fish, particularly caracins, where they sort of shoal alongside them. So you can see in the flooded riverbank here, they're shoaling with uh, Hyphosobrichoneckes and uh, darting through the grasses. They're very attractive fish. I haven't ever seen them in the hobby. They would be, they would be wonderful because they are, they max out at about three centimeter and they're really dainty and lovely. Uh, their cousin, Caracidium uh, AFF zebra, uh, which is a sort of more traditional benthnic uh, species, has these great big pectoral fins like, uh, that give it traction and, and almost suction, if you like, like gobies. They tend to hop and bounce around on the bottom and they graze on uh, algae and alcohooks. Uh, you see them occasionally in the Salobra uh, Delta. They tend to prefer habitat, which is much more uh, fast flowing uh, with boulders. Um, I have a video here. This is actually from the, the Pio Vergi in the north of Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, which is a very fast flowing habitat. And you find them in large numbers kind of all perched out on this exposed rock. Um, species like these would be great for a biotope project. You could even get one of those um, 3D uh, back it lie it flat on the bottom of your aquarium and then put in uh, direct some very powerful filters on it let it get covered in algae and alkalis and growth and simulate this sort of uh, rock face uh, with the fish uh, grazing over it uh hopeless missionero which is known as the traira here or the wolf fish is, is one of the most sort of easy to spot uh they're everywhere during the day and the night you see them sat around um interesting that you see them everywhere, but I've never actually seen one make an attack. Uh, a friend of mine who's examined their stomachs has said that they appear, individuals appear to have quite discerning tastes. So you'll open uh, from one habitat as well. Um, and they'll be full of frogs and very few fish. And then in the nearby, they're one particular species of fish or one particular species of aquatic uh, invertebrate, depending on the size. So they're, they, they are voracious, but they tend to choose their prey and they seem to go into hunting mode uh, more at night as well. Um, they're from the, the family Hoplius, the biggest member of course is Hoplius Aymada, which is this monster from the Amazon. Uh, the Hoplius here grow to about 60 centimeters. Um, and you can see them sat out amongst leaf litter or amongst plants. So here in the top, you can see just chilling and uh, the tetras don't really seem bothered. Um, and it, it's that notion as well, you know, we always think of piranhas constantly on the attack or, or wolf fish constantly attacking, and yet they don't. However, if you throw a lure or bait in front of them, they will always attack it. And the, the disconnect between how they react to artificial, you know, uh, prey stimulus and prey that's around them all the time uh, is something that would be quite interesting to study. The bottom video you can just see in the middle uh, with its tail facing towards us, a juvenile hoplius, and you can see how well their camouflage works. I mean, it just looks like another bit of leaf litter or twig amongst the detritus, and the, the tetras have no idea uh, that he's lying there. Uh, they have the cousin, uh, the golden wolf fish, is Hoplierothenus uniconiatus. Uh, these are, again, voracious predators. Um, they will, <laughs> there's a small juvenile that photographed there, and I had it in a I transported it back to our lab along with four other juveniles that were the same size. And by the time we got back to the lab, there was only one juvenile left alive and there were four, three other heads lying around and he had consumed his, uh, his siblings. Um, we find them ten in the margins along the streams as we saw earlier, in ditches. Uh, you often find them in, in pairs or, or small gangs if you like. Uh, larger individuals are active in the dark um, in the main river channel. And this is a, an interesting species that it can, um, it can breathe atmospheric air. And uh, like the European eel, it will wriggle out of a draining or dwindling pond or pool and can sort of walk in the way that Chana do um, to the nearest water body. And that's one of the ways it can continue surviving the, the dry season uh, when other fish perish as the water disappears. And it can do that because of its vascularized swim bladder that lets it uh, function as a breathing organ. Um, so when you see these fish kind of waddling from, a, from the one pool to the next. It really makes you think of the, the, uh, the first fish to leave the ocean you know, millions and millions of years ago and set in motion uh, the evolution that resulted in us. Um, you can see them here in the, in the top. They're in a top photo at the edge of a lake, a pair of them, fairly small. And then in the bottom, 
uh, a group of them uh, in one of the uh, savannah drainage ditches. This is a Paradon nasa, so this is a very, very active uh, fish. It grazes on, on algae and alfus. It's very territorial. Again, it's more species we find uh, in fast flowing uh, hill stream type environments. Uh, they're pretty territorial and aggressive towards one another. They don't really tolerate each other very well. Um, they've got this sort of chisel-like teeth that they use to rasp uh, biofilm and, and alfalfa off the rocks. Um, and uh, they tend to have a sort of circular habitat, so they'll stop in three or four places and repeat the same cycle, grazing at each spot. And they always go, the ones I've, I've watched, it's always a clockwise rotation, which is interesting. Uh, and perhaps that's how their habitat, so their territory is, is defined. Um, and they will fight off uh, any, anyone else who encroaches on that space. Obviously, pretty much everyone knows this one, Phagocentris natureri, classic piranha. Uh, they're quite common in the main river channel, but also in the, in the lakes and um, in the reservoirs. And we see them in large numbers in the in the wet season coming together perhaps to breed and spawn. They're not the mindless killers that everyone thinks they are. You can swim with them. Um, they tend to avoid you actually because piranhas are eaten by pretty much every other larger predator in the, in the Pantanal. One of the interesting things is that many piranhas uh, are actually, they don't consume fish as much as they consume uh, pieces of fins of other fish. So they are fin nipping uh, species, which is a strategy known as uh, pterygophagy, where they try and bite up chunks of, of other fins from other species, and they tend to target cichlids particularly. Uh, there's a very interesting article I've included here uh, by uh, Ivan Sazima from the 1980s, where he observed uh, piranhas in, in, in Pantanal, and he saw the different strategies that various cichlids had to avoid having their fins nipped. Um, so some species, uh, like cichlosoma, form sort of wagon trail uh, rings and they're facing outwards with the tails in the middle uh, so the piranha can't come in. Prenocicla will actually stand up and lay their flat, their tail flat on the substrate. Um, so uh, it's a really good article. I recommend uh, people look it up and this strategy of eating uh, fins is good because every six, within six weeks the fins grow back. You don't kill off your victim. It's a constant uh, resource. It's always around. Um, so it's, it's quite a good strategy for, for survival. Um, one of the other species we have is Cerasamus maculatus, which is again very focused on fin nipping, uh, but they are very shy. Uh, when I try and film or snorkel near them, as you can see, they sort of always keep a, a fair distance between me um, because they're eaten by giant otters and caiman and, and birds will take them. Um, I've learned that uh, aquarists have actually managed to introduce them into the Tigris River in Iraq, which is <laughs> rather sad when you think of everything else Iraq has got had to go through. It's also now got piranhas. Um, but uh, that also shows you how resilient they are, um, how wherever the, the conditions are right, they, they can thrive. Cerastalmus marginatus is this sort of fairly hefty species with this underbite. Um, it's also the only species that's, uh, oh sorry, the most frequent uh, perpetrator in incidents of people having been bitten whilst swimming. Uh, recently, this happened in Argentina. Quite a few bathers were bitten. Uh, this is because these fish tend to build their nests over open sand in shallow areas. And that's the kind of place that people will try and bathe in beach type habitats in the rivers, particularly in Paraguay Basin. And because those shallow habitats, um, the temperature is often increased, the fish are more nervous, they're prepared to defend their nests. And they will, if you think it's quite brave, they rush and attack a giant lumbering sort of person. Um, to sort of get them to stay away from their young. Uh, we perceive it as an attack. They are simply obviously defending, defending their nests. We've got Leperinus Friderici, known locally as Piau. Uh, the, uh, the name is derived from Leperinus for hair. Um, and they have these symphysial uh, teeth, these sort of buck teeth at the front, which helps them to crush uh, crustacea, but also seeds and nuts. Um, and I've seen them a few times just crumbling crabs as if they were dust, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, one of the very attractive species we have here is Leperinus striatus, which is a very small uh, species, perhaps maybe 11 centimeters, the largest I've ever seen, uh, which is a big individual. 
um, here they're known as pen knife or uh, we sometimes call them the lipstick leperinus because the red dips on the, on the mouth. Um, you find them foraging and grazing on, on algae over uh, substrates across uh, rocks and boulders um, and they're, the lines that they have along the body is really quite effective for breaking up the form, the outline of the fish which makes them less obvious uh, as a target for predators. They're very nervous and they're very fast swimmers. Getting near them is quite tricky. Uh, we've got Schizodon uh, borelli, which is, I don't have a photo on the water, I'm afraid, which is a large sort of cousin of the, the other Leperinus. Um, we see occasionally they've only collected a couple from, from the uh, Salobra. And we also got Schizodon ichnathus, and this is quite a, a rare species. Um, I've only filmed it twice there, and I've never managed to collect it. Um, and it's got this lovely red tail, this great big lateral line down the flank. And we usually see them hanging out with uh, similar shaped fish, so other, other Leperinus or with uh, Propylodus lineatus. Uh, from the family Kuromatidae, we've got Sipocarax gili, which is a small silver uh, carasiform, hangs out at lower levels in, in, in little groups and is foraging amongst leaf litter and particularly found in flooded meadows or in the main river channel near the riverbank where there's sunken roots and, and, and fallen branches. Again, they're very nervy. They get spooked if I, if I come too close or too quick. And they've got this black spot on the caudal butuncle which simulates an eye, which is a, a way of discouraging predators uh, who sort of have to second guess, are they attacking the head or the, the tail? And also, um, it makes it hard for Finn nipping piranha to decide that, oh, this is actually the tail that I need to attack. Sectogastra curviventris, another caris form. Uh, I haven't mentioned it, I've only collected it, I haven't got any information uh, from photos of seeing it underwater. I know that we found it in this uh, floodplain lake. Um, it's lovely silver coloration, which is good for species that move out into open water because it reflects the light around them and actually. About this, except that they are um, different from the majority of carisons, they, they don't have teeth. Steinachnerina brevipina. So this is a fish that's quite recognisable in the delta. They hang out at lower levels, uh, sort of bumbling over the substrates and foraging together uh, for aquatic invertebrates and, and edible detritus. Um, in the dry season, tend to find them in the main river channel and in the lagoons. But in the wet season, they'll move into the meadows. And again, they have that lovely black lateral line that helps break up their shape. Uh, you can see in the clip here a male trying to uh, woo a female. She's not particularly interested. Um, so they've got these big eyes, which are good for looking out for, uh, for prey, but also for predators, um, as they're busy feeding with their, their heads uh, turned down. Um, so they need to have this large eye with a large field of view so they can see what's going on as they, uh, as they forage. Uh, they've great big tails, and um, so they can put on quite a turn of speed when they're, when they're spooked. Um, and these clips show you uh, them foraging in the main river channel and also along the, the edge of the lagoons. Um, they tend to hang out in bands of anything from three to sort of 25 individuals, more or less. Uh, Procolotus lineatus, the famous Kurimba. This is one of our, our largest species. It's a uh, migratory fish. It swims up river to spawn. And it's also known as an ecosystem engineer because it consumes uh, fruits, nuts, and seeds. And then it's one of the fish that deposit these across the flooded landscape during the wet season, leading to the growth of, of new forest and, and areas of trees. Um, and they also are constantly digging up the substrates, which means there's the cycling of nutrients and uh, prevents uh, gas bubbles and, and other noxious material building up because they're constantly digging. Um, so they are really important to the, the ecosystem here. Uh, the photo on the left is from the uh, Sukuri River, which is in a Highland River, um, where you find uh, as well, and they have this lovely bluish coloration to them. In the Salobra, they look a more grey colour. Part of it is the, due to the transparency and quality of the water, um, but uh, they're, they're quite attractive. And uh, the video on the right, they'll, they'll shoal together with other large carisins, and they will uh, they'll move around you and, and sort of buffet you almost. It can be quite a uh, one of the very small species we have is Pyrolina australis. Um, there's quite a few Pyrolina that are beginning to enter the hobby, although this species is, as yet, I haven't seen it available. It may be available somewhere. Uh, so it's 
built and designed pretty much for taking insects at the surface. It's flat back, large eye, powerful tail for leaping up and grabbing prey. We tend to find them along uh, marginal vegetation, particularly amongst the, the Icornia, hoping that uh, you know, small insects will stumble into the water, lots of spiders, crickets, and flies. But you also find them in the wet season in great numbers in the main river channel where they come together uh, perhaps uh, for breeding and um, mixing with other carousins to get lovely shoals. And you really begin to notice how the, the black line through the eyes is quite attractive on them. And they have this reddish copper coloration to the, the base of the tail, uh, which is really nice. Um, I think they would be a great species to have in the hobby if it were, if it were possible. The Tricorthidae, which are the Tricorthias, we've got two species there, Nematurus, which is a large, uh, large species, about 25, 30 centimeters, and Pantanensis, which stays much smaller. Um, Tricorthidae is found across uh, Cisandia in Latin America, so across Latin America, west of the Andes. They normally prefer fairly sluggish habitats, and their diet is general, although they tend to focus on anything they can get at the surface, so particularly uh, insects and fall, fall and fruit and seeds. And they have this unique adaptation in their mouth that lets them project their jaw um, and sort of scoop oxygen from the surface, which means that when other fish are, are dying in, in shrinking ponds and pools from the lack of uh, water in the water, lack of oxygen in the water column, Tripotheus is still able to access uh, oxygen and can survive for much longer. This is a lovely species, this is Brycnox melanurus, which is sort of elongated. Uh, cigar-shaped kerosene. Um, you always observe them in the Pantanal leaping for insects. They will jump you know, half a meter above the surface, grab, in, grab insects out of the air. They will take them to the surface. Um, I've also found them in very fast flowing conditions in other parts of the state. Um, but in the Slobber Delta, we see them mostly in the, in the lagoons uh, where the water is still, perhaps because the surface movement is much less and it's easier to hunt for insects. A very attractive fish. Another member of the Iguanodecti family is Gearbox melanostoma. Uh, so this is lovely sort of electric greenish translucent body. Uh, it's got an omnivorous diet, it will feed on pretty much anything. Um, and you see it underwater, sometimes swimming in a sort of headstander type style. You'll be able to see uh, in a moment. You can see some here swimming with a uh, Poptella uh, paraguensis underneath the roots of uh, Icornia in the main river channel and they're swimming you know, horizontally. But then you also find sometimes that so this is that the same habitat, you know, Ceratophyllum demersum tangled into the stems of, of Icornia, and here you see the Piabucus, and then they'll swim away and they do this sort of headstander swimming, which is quite a, I don't know if it's a defense mechanism or, or what, but uh, they do it from time to time. Um, and we normally always find them in the main river channel near to the beds of uh, aquatic vegetation. Brycon hilaris is one of our most famous species, Pirapuktanga, uh, which is found across the, the region, across the Paraguay Basin. It's famous, we've seen it on BBC documentaries, leaping to tear you know, fruit from overhanging branches. Uh, anything that falls to the surface, insects, berries, nuts, it will, it will eat. Uh, and it was actually able to, in a split second, differentiate between ripe and unripe Fruit. I have a friend of mine who's looking into how they do that, but if you throw a ripe berry on the surface, they'll go for it. If you throw an unripe berry on the surface, they, they barely even start to move towards it. Uh, and that makes sense because the amount of energy they would uh, expend constantly rushing towards unripe fruit uh, might be energy that they could use for fleeing predators or for breeding or for finding you know, better foraging habitat. And like the Kurimba, they're important as uh, seed dispersers. Um, they're most easily seen in the karst rivers of the Bodicada Highlands, which are not that far away in Matagorsk and Sul, a couple of hours from the, from the Salobra Delta, uh, where the waters are much more transparent and you really get to see how fantastic their, their colours are, beautiful fish. And perhaps not more beautiful than Salminus brasiliensis, which is the famous Dorado, which is this giant salmon-like uh, species. Um, this photo is again from the Bodicada Highlands but we do have them in the Salobra Delta. Um, and it's quite usual to see sort of gangs of uh, sub-adults and juveniles uh, in the main river channel. Uh, one of the interesting things to note is that they predate, they prey on... When the juvenile Dorado uh, hatch and as, as they begin to develop, 
they have very similar markings to young Brycon Hilarites and even the adults. And so the young Dorado joins the shoal of Brycon Hilarite and spends its formative years with them, growing alongside them. And it can do so because it mimics them. Um, but one day it gets so large that it can no longer easily join the shoal and its uh, coloration changes and the Pitipukunga no longer allow it to enter their shoal. But of course it spent years studying how the Pitipukunga avoid predators, what they do to evade them, where they go, when they're active, when they're distracted. And so it's done a sort of uh, internship which has, then allows it to predate on the, on the Pitipukunga um, much more successfully. And they will eat them you know, head first, they swallow the whole fish. Um, so it's uh, quite a sinister but also interesting relationship between the two. Uh, younger Dorado will attack pretty much anything, like these small tetras in the shallows. They'll come charging in and try and force, trap the fish between the, the shallowest part of the riverbank where it's flooded uh, and the, the large open mouth of the Dorado. As you can see, attacking in Moncalze Foreschi here on, a, on the flooded riverbank. Uh, I've gone and looked at spe specimens that were collected in the 1940s, um, which is quite a, an interesting trip from the Salobra actually. And um, here we have a male dorado in the middle, uh, and trying to nip at the underbelly of the, of the female, trying to stimulate her into spawning. And here's me with a sort of fairly small adult uh, caught in the pants now, but you can see how beautiful the coloration of these fish is. Now one, oh, here we go, yeah. We had questions earlier about ancestral hincus, about the, the dogfish, the freshwater barracuda. Um, so these are very, very fast swimmers. They have this massive tail, torpedo-like body, you know, snouts, they cut through the water. Um, they quite often are seen trapping small fish against the bank. So they'll start assaulting the shoal of small fish and the, the little fish have nowhere to go, but they leap out of the water and onto the, onto the bank. Um, and you, sometimes you're alerted to this because small birds start hopping down amongst the bank and, grabbing the poor fish that have just managed to escape the, the ancestor hingus. Um, and before they can sort of flip and jump back into the water, the birds snap them up. Ancestor hingus, again, they possess this uh, eye spot on the tail, but also on the shoulder, uh, which is probably to confuse particularly uh, fin nipping piranhas. This is a species that many will recognize, Aphiocarax rathgunai. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I think that due to the amount of vegetation that they consume in, in forms of algae, um, they have this lovely green, sh sort of shining electric, brilliant green color to them. Uh, they're one of my favorite fish. And uh, you see them a lot in the main river channel, in the flooded meadows, um, and also in the lakes. We collected many of them. So here you can see them in a flooded meadow, uh, grazing an algae that's growing on the submerged leaves uh, after they've been recently flooded. Um, and again, this would be a great biotope to recreate, you know, using a persicaria or polygonum. Um, use, I think in some countries it's now banned, but you could have used uh, gymnocorimbus. No, yeah, gymnocorimbus. Um, a fast growing plant uh, to simulate a flooded meadow and, and fill it with a, a group of these lovely little fish and let the algae let rip and see if they graze on it as well. Um, so they're one of the most recognizable species for anyone who's got a, a background in aquarium in the hobby um, and we see them across the delta but in the wet season is when they are most abundant probably due to the number of the amount of resources and coming together to breed. They have a cousin which is Aphiocarax dentatus is a slightly larger species. Um, it looks like a great aquarium fish you know lovely olive greenish color bright red tail um, but they will swallow fish their own size as my colleague uh, Hedy Berta uh, Jimmy Junior discovered at the, the quarantine center where they, where they have old fish here. Uh, he had uh, Aphiocarax dentatus in a tank with Aphiocarax rathgunai, and um, one day arrived and the rathgunai had been eaten, just its tail was hanging out of the mouth of, of dentatus. And dentatus isn't much bigger, so it will consume prey almost its own body size. Um, so perhaps not a great community species, although a very attractive fish. Uh, we normally see them near the surface, particularly in the dry season in, in large numbers. Um, but they also, you'll see them taking insects uh, at the surface. Another one that's well known to many people, largely for its terrible behavior in aquarium, is uh, Aphiocarax netareri, uh, which I think was formerly known as Aphiocarax paraguayensis, or known as the dawn tetra, famous for being a bully and nipping everybody else uh, in the tank. Um, however, if you keep them in a large group, that behavior tends to be restricted within, within their own species. Um, it's all part of battling uh, 
to determine hierarchy. We see them now and then in the, in the main river channel. Uh, and one of the problems we're trying to find and identify small species is, as you can see, it can be quite confusing if you're filming or photographing to pick out a particular individual or a particular species um, from the many, you know, the, the swarm that's swimming around you. Uh, this is Afiokaris and his I don't have any photos of the species in the wild. These are my own captive specimens. Uh, I've collected a couple uh, from a water meadow habitat in the delta. Um, and also from the margins of the lakes uh, in, in the Pantanal, so amongst uh, Iconia crested and it's and at surface, they're lovely fish. Three of these, and they're all from a, a Pantanal lake, a Salobra lake like this one. Um, they belong to the family Astyanax, which is a huge family distributed from Texas down to Patagonia and includes the famous uh, blind, the, the cave tetra. Um, Alenae is not a common species in the Pantanal, in the Salobra. I've only collected them and I've never seen them. Um, but uh, they seem to be uh, found alongside other medium-sized parasins. Uh, Astyanax lacustris, which is known locally as Lombardi, is uh, one of the most common species in, in the Pantanal, in fact, across the, the Paraguay with the basin. Uh, it's omnivorous, it will eat anything, small fish, insects, fruits, seeds, anything. Um, it grows quite large, but with chunky uh, tetra, and uh, can gather in huge numbers uh, in the wet season, them together to spawn. And it's one of the species that is most preyed upon by other creatures uh, in the Pantanal. And we get a phenomenon which is quite interesting, which I'm going to show you now. Hopefully it works. So, in the Pantanal, you get this phenomenon where uh, Dorado, the Salmonis brotilensis, start attacking shoals of Afghanic Lacustris. Um, and the ferns, um, uh, they do the simplex, which appear in the wet season here. They see the commotion and they start diving down and grabbing the panic uh, textures at the surface. Um, so it's. Uh, it's similar to the, the baseball phenomenon in the sea, where you have the sardines being attacked by tuna and seals and dolphins, and then, you know, gamets start diving in. Um, so this is the behavior that myself and, and University of Sydney Junior we recorded uh, in the canton out here. And uh, it's quite amazing to see it. But I think, well, it happens in the, in the ocean, we in the micro, micro uh, example here in the wetlands. Right, let's, so. Carax latissier, this is a sort of another uh, fin nipping fish. Um, it's known to be predated on quite a bit by the wolf fish. Um, I've collected mostly juvenile individuals. They have this lovely sort of scribbled brown markings across them. Um, and I've collected them in flooded water meadows. Here is a flooded path full of a uh, marginal vegetation where we collected them from. This is one that pretty much everyone here will recognize, I think. Uh, Gymnocrimbus tenitsi, also known as the black widow or the black skirt tetra. Uh, here we tend to find them in uh, lake habitats. Or I've, I've not seen them anywhere else except within the lakes, um, which is interesting. And the way to, to get them to appear on camera is to sit in the lake with your, your legs and your feet. And here you can see a Celogrammus kennedy grazing on me, but here turn up some of the uh, the Gymnogrimbus uh, and come to investigate. And it's a little nerve wracking to do this because the lakes are very murky at this time. I think it's in dry season. Uh, there's a very large male caiman in there that are quite curious and aggressive. Um, and there's, you know, other worries, snakes and all the rest. But um, you just sit there, put the camera under the water, and then you look at it afterwards, and you, you get to see what, uh, what turned up to uh, pick at you. It's sort of a dermatological session, spa session. Hemigramus lunatus. So this is one of the less colorful uh, members of the Hemigramus family, um, but it's still beautiful because of its translucent body, depending on the, the level of tannins and the level of light uh, in the environment, it can have this sort of lovely lime greens uh, or sort of greenish brown colors to them. Uh, you find them often foraging over leaf litter in the main river channel. Um, you can see how being translucent is quite useful camouflage. So in order to spot them, I have to come quite close. As soon as I get a little distance away, they blend into the the bloom of the river. Um, so being translucent is, is an effective way of being out in the open and uh, being less visible to 
to predators. They have a cousin, which is Hemigramus Neptunus, which looks very much like Hemigramus uh, ocelica from the Amazon basin, the head and tail like tetra, except uh, Neptunus is, uh, is only found in the Paraguay basin. Um, and they have this lovely, you know, electric orange above the eye, which is um, based on the, the guanine crystals that develop within their cells, which are called uh, iridocytes. Um, and we find these particularly in the, in the lakes and in the main river channel in the Salobra Delta. Uh, and in the main river channel, they will often mix in with shoals of other characins. You get these mega shoals. Um, and uh, you can see I'm being buffeted about a bit by the current trying to film. Um, but when they come together, it can be very difficult to try and spot a particular species. Um, in the wet season, you get this huge abundance. You know, fish come together to breed. There's lots of food to sustain them. There's habitat. There's safety in terms of structural habitat. Um, and then in the wet season, a lot of these species sort of seem to almost disappear. And that rise and fall, particularly amongst small caracins, is, is quite common uh, in the Pantanal. We've got Hemigramus tridens. This is the second smallest species of uh, caracin in the, uh, in the Salobra. Uh, but it's one of the most common and abundant. Wherever and whenever we collected, we caught this little fish. They're quite beautiful. They have a lovely blue ring uh, around the eye, at least the males do. And they will do little mating. Um, they hang out in midwater and also near to marginal plants. And I think I can show you, we find them quite often in the lakes, um, just sort of picking items that are drifting in, in the current. Um, one of the reasons, the reasons that these fish are so common uh, is due to their size. Um, they are able to occupy the first flooded habitats when the rain arrive, and they can stay there longer than any other fish until there's barely any water near the, towards the, the dry season, and then they can retreat back into the main river channel. So they have the longest period of time to occupy habitat uh, that is initially too shallow and later, again, too shallow for other species to utilize. And that gives them access to food uh, for much longer than others, it means they're in breeding condition, they can breed year round, they have an omnivorous diet, they eat whatever they can find. And that's why particularly small fish and especially small caracins are the most common and most abundant um, in, in this uh, habitat. This is a favorite of mine, I think of many other people here, perhaps is Hemigramus ulreae, the black line tetra, which was made uh, famous by Takashi Amano in, in his uh, aquascapes. Um, and it's now quite easy to find in the hobby. Uh, they're beautiful, they get quite large uh, in captivity. In the wild, you see them sort of medium size. I think they get eaten before they get too big. Um, and they have that black line that when they come together in a group, as you can see, it's sort of confusing. It's hard to distinguish an individual. Um, we find them mostly in the, in the lakes and in the main uh, riverbank areas in the main river. And you can see some swimming over a bit of leaf litter and submerged terrestrial vegetation at the flooded edges of the Slobula River here. Uh, there's Matriacrax Rathbunai with them, there's Hypersobrecon Equis. Uh, it'd be really easy to do a biotope with these guys, um, with maybe some uh, marginal palm plants and leaf litter, um, and these three species of tetra, and you're, you're set, you've got a Pantanal biotope. So one of the interesting things here is we've got uh, gold versions of this tetra and also other species, particularly Hypersobrecon Equis and Mukazi Foresti. Um, where they're infected by these very small trematode parasites. And that causes a reaction in the fish's skin and raises the levels of guanine deposits, which turns the fish a brilliant gold or silver, like the famous uh, gold tetras from the Amazon. It's the same deal. Uh, we think it's lovely. It's actually not great news for the fish because suddenly they stand out amongst the shoal. They're very visible to the predators. It could well be that the parasite's ultimate goal is to advance it or complete its life cycle within the digestive tract of predators. So even perhaps within birds or uh, fish like wolf fish. Um, so they are essentially making the poor infected fish an easy target um, so they can con continue their life cycle. Uh, Hyphus broken in lackeys, so the sedge tetra, which has also in the last few years become quite popular in the hobby. Um, we find them small numbers in the Salobra Delta. The males have this lovely blue ring around the eye and the, the extended finish, which they splay when they do their mating dances. And we tend to find them in amongst floating plants uh, along the banks of uh, the river. Um, and never in great numbers, but always alongside other small caracins. 
very recognizable species here, perhaps the most recognizable is Hypersporica equis, which is known as the Mato Grosso here, but we know it as the Serpe tetra. Um, and very widespread distribution across the Amazon and across the Paraguay River Basin. Um, wild species specimens have fantastically deep red coloration, probably related to diets and the large amount of uh, microorganisms, proteins they're consuming, and uh, they're easy to spot. Um, and we might wonder, you know, being this color is not great news. Uh, you're easily invisible to predators. When they come together to breed in the wet season, particularly you get large groups of them, it becomes difficult to distinguish a single individual as they sort of blend together. Uh, but for the rest of the year, we often find them in smaller groups and it makes, makes you wonder why they, why have this color? It's something that has yet to be uh, well understood. But you can see them here, they, they are beautiful. Um, and then we've got Hypersoprical megalopterus, which we know in the trade as the black phantom tetra, because all the trade specimens are black, but the wild specimens are red. And at some point, someone decided to import this species and try and breed black variants with also the larger finage. And I do wonder if it's because the, they were collected together with Hypersoprical equis with the serpe tetra. <clears throat> and in order to increase market revenue, rather than sell two red fish, why don't we sell one redfish and one bluish blackfish? And perhaps this is what uh, led to uh, the, the dominance of the black form. Um, we find them uh, coexisting with hypersubrachonekis, which raises questions about how they manage to occupy the same habitat at the same time. Are they competing for the same resources? Um, that's something we need to look into. And you find them in the main river channel and also in the, on the, along the edges of lakes, often in quite large uh, groups alongside Hypersoprone and Equis. And uh, they are lovely. I, I would love to be able to introduce, reintroduce the wild colour form into to the hobby. Creona brahma paraguayensis is the cousin of the famous uh, glass bloodfin tetra, which is Creona brahma filigera. Um, I've only collected a few of these in uh, flooded uh, meadow habitats amongst terrestrial vegetation, but they are found here. And we nearly always collect them near the surface um, where they're probably hunting for insects near to flooded vegetation. This is the habitat where we collect them. This is a bit of this uh, meadow flooded by the uh, Salobrina tributary. It's lots of marginal vegetation, um, in, completely inundated. And this is where we've collected the, the Prino Brahma. Stupiaba agapagasta is a small, very active tetra, lovely greenish. Uh, shimmers to it. We normally find them in much faster flowing habitats. Um, they are very, very active. I haven't seen them in the trade, um, but they are one of the species that when you get into the water, they are the first ones to come up and start tearing out bits of your skin and ripping out hairs, which can be quite uncomfortable. Um, at first it's cute, but then it becomes a little bit, uh, a little bit tiring. Um, so you can see here just a few examples from uh, faster flowing habitats that they really like to be in, uh, be in strong current. Mokazi bonita, this is a lovely uh, tetra um, and it has a significant morphological difference to specimens from other parts of the, the state. So in the Pantanal they have these red and yellow uh, coloration to the fins but, and white tips on the fins but they're not particularly uh, fancy in any way. Um, but in the, uh, in the Bodicada Highlands to the south the males especially are completely different. They have lovely bluish silver coloration, black tails, flaring fins, white tips, red base at the fins. Um, and I've just put up here an article um, which is about this uh, diversity of morphological design basically. And if anyone wanted to, uh, to look that up on a research gate or somewhere, uh, if, they had, if they were interested, Mokasa decora, this is a species that's beginning occasionally to appear in the trade. I, I, I know that some shops can get it. Uh, it's a tetra that needs quite a lot of swimming space. It's a large tetra, gets pretty big, likes open water and likes to be together in large numbers. Um, and they shoal together and there's those black tips uh, twitch in the current and you can see that they can handle quite a lot of flow. So this is in, in the dry season when the water is very turbid, the current is very strong and they're hanging out in mid water together. Uh, thousands of them. Um, it would be quite a, a nice fish for an aquarium, but only for very big, big tanks, really. Oh, and you can see the Caracidium laterale was shoaling with them at the end there as well. 
the little carous forms that we talked about earlier, the data carousels. Mokazo Foreshi looks ex almost exactly like Mokazo um, Sancta Philomene, our famous red eye tetra. Um, here we find them for much of the year in fairly small groups, uh, particularly along the edges of lakes. Um, but then in the wet season, they appear in their thousands. But they are another species that is uh, infected by the, the trematodes that we looked at earlier. Um, and here in Brazil, uh, scientists call them uh, uh, tetra chapada, the stoned tetra, as in they've been smoking marijuana because of the red, the red eyes, which is the sort of affectionate name that we give them here. Um, so we find them in the wet season in large numbers. They like to hang out uh, underneath structures and underneath fallen branches and leaves, um, but will also emerge into, into open water, as you see here, and, and blend with other, other species. Their cousin is Moncazo Lee, uh, in species. Um, you always find them in fairly small numbers, in twos and threes, perhaps swimming alongside Moncazo Foresti and nearly always found uh, near the bank, particularly amongst uh, fallen branches and twigs. They like very complex habitat. They seem quite shy species. This is uh, Odontostubli Pekir. It's a tetra I've not seen in the trade at any point. Um, we see them sometimes in quite large shoals in the main river channel. Um, and other times they appear sort of to disappear. Although they're very small, sort of two, three centimeters, um, colleagues of mine have observed them attacking other fish, either sort of in small groups or as a swarm, uh, particularly Leperinus Fredericii, and they, they swim up to them, tear out pieces of, of, of flesh. Um, it might be that this is, happens in the dry season when they need a protein boost. They're not finding as many aquatic invertebrates, and so they start to target uh, other sources of protein. Um, they have this black spot on the core of the dunkel. Uh, you can just about make out a group of them here swimming over this pile of leaf litter. Uh, and again, it shows you how sort of having a sort of beige, gray, silverish coloration helps you blend in. And again, that black spot makes it more difficult for um, predator to distinguish an individual when they come together, but also to decide which end is the head and which end is the tail. Another master of uh, the black spots are the Pinacogasta tegatus. I think we sometimes call them the three spot tetra because they have the black eye, the spot in the middle of the flank, and then on the corner of the dunkel. Um, and also the white spots there. When they come together, it's quite a confusing jumble. Uh, again, difficult for a predator to, to attack. And we tend to find them over beds of leaf litter or low over the substrate, uh, normally in the shoal of several hundred of them. Um, and they're also semi-translucent, as you can see in the photo there. They sort of, uh, the light passes through them, which helps them blend in. As you can see here, I've photographed them in the, in the photo on the left, but they seem to disappear and even when you're filming them, as soon as they swim over a dark patch, they go dark. As soon as they swim over sand, they go light. It's quite hard to, to follow them and, and track them down in, in the main river. Coptella paraguensis is a large tetra of angular. Uh, and the open water of the river. Again, another fish that's partially translucent, reflective scales, bounce back light. Uh, when they come together in large shoals, difficult for predators to uh, to single out an individual to attack. Um, and they nearly always found in sort of mid to upper water levels, particularly against strong current. We've got uh, Salidodum marione, which was originally Astyanax marione, it's been changed. This is a lovely kerosene. Um, you see them here, this sort of yellow silver body with the red finish. Um, you see them along the banks uh, in the main river channel in the Salobra. I have never seen them in the trade, but they are, they are quite attractive fish. Uh, and you see them sort of loose groups hanging out with other small, small carousins. Celegramus Kennedy, which you saw earlier picking at, at my legs. Um, this is, has fish that out, out of the water. It can be a sort of bluish, malachite, gray, green color. Um, I haven't seen them in the trade, but they are fairly peaceful carousins. We catch them in small numbers, uh, particularly in the lakes near the margins. Roboides microlepis, this is not a tranquil kerosin, this is a scale eating uh, tetra and um, has teeth that are almost on the outside of its body so it can uh, scrape off the scales of other fish, which is a process known as lepidophagy. And we tend to collect them 
in the main river channel. I think someone has their microphone on at the moment. Um, and particularly, you can see them at night, at dusk. So as the sun sets, you pull out a torch, and then you see these fish swimming in the main river channel. I, I, Ty, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Uh, anyone who has their microphone on, uh, please uh, turn that off. Um, it's quite loud, and it's uh, oh, we cannot hear. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so I was just saying that this uh, Robotis macrolepis is particularly active at night. So as dusk falls, we shine a, a strong torch on the river, and then you can see them sort of cruising in midwater. Um, it may be that it's easier for them to attack fish to nip, uh, to eat scales off um, at night. They have a large eye, which would permit that sort of nocturnal activity as well. Uh, two of the most common fish we have there, Serafinus caliurus and Serafinus crigi. These are two very small silver-bodied tetras. Again, they're so ubiquitous and so common and in so abundant because they are small. They can access all sorts of habitats for very long periods of time. Uh, they have an omnivorous diet and they breed all year round. Uh, so we tend to find them in huge numbers in the wet season, um, often sh shoaling together and mixed in with other caracins. Um, and yet, yeah, you catch thousands of them in, in one go with a, with a dip net. Um, the black spot on the caudal peduncle with the white edging is a feature found in many species in the Pantanal and in the Salobra Delta. And that allows them to shoal together and become this confusing jumble for predators. Um, so they, different caracins and even different families have adapted this, uh, this same sort of mimicry um, and means they can all hang out in the main water column with a reduced chance of being predated. And I think you can see in this, uh, this clip here again. So we've got uh, Serpinus caliurus and, and Serpinus crigi in there. Um, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to target a predator. I think there's even some Phenicogaster in there at one point. Uh, Hemigramus tridens, um, and this sort of jumble of, of, uh, of black and white spots. It's very confusing. Tetragonopterus argenteus, uh, this is one of the earliest identified species from the, from, uh, the Pantanal, I believe Cuvier in 1815, I think, identified it. Um, and uh, they're large garrisons. I've seen them only, I think Glazer has started importing them into Europe. Uh, we find them out in mid-water. They're also very active at night. Um, and you see them sort of swimming out in the main water column. And uh, large eyes, omnivorous diet, um, lovely red finish to them, this beautiful big uh, black-edged dorsal fin. And then we have the smallest species in the Slobra Delta, and the last of the, the Caraciforms. This is Chenorobrican macropus. I've never found it over 10 millimeters. It's uh, the second smallest freshwater species in Latin America. And they hang out at the surface of the, water, of the river, in the main river channel. And they're partially translucent. Um, and it's very difficult to actually sort of spot them once they're in the gloom or looking up at them from beneath. Um, and they're so small that avian predators, mostly birds, uh, would ignore them. They're just too small. So that means they're able to hang out in a part of the water that other small fish could not risk uh, straying. So the open water at the surface, which perhaps lets them access resources uh, unavailable to others. Um, they have this great big tail, big powerful uh, uh, pectoral fins that lets them battle the, the strong current in the, in the open water. Right, that's the caris forms done. Um, this I know is, is Michael's uh, third bit, which is the gymnotiforms. So we start with Eigenmania. My fish. Very nervous, shy species. The video here where I found it on the flooded riverbank at night and just sort of glides away into the vegetation, very difficult to spot, uh, even with a torch. Um, they have an electromagnetic frequency, which they use to navigate and to hunt and possibly to communicate with each other. We tend to find them in sort of very swampy habitats and in marginal habitat, like you see here, uh, where there's lots of terrestrial vegetation and, and semi-aquatic vegetation. And they're known to feed on aquatic invertebrates, but also on sort of edible detritus. This is a species that I believe from time to time is available in the hobby. This is Gymnotus crapo australis, which is another uh, lovely uh, gymnotiform. Unfortunately, here it's more commonly seen in bait shops. It's particularly used for fishing for large catfish and, and species like dorado. 
Um, and again, it's a species that you see at night, sort of gliding along the shallow, hunting amongst the root networks, and will feed on small crustacea, invertebrates, and other small fishes. And again, it has these electric discharges, which are an important part of its sort of social interactions and its hunting strategy. And then we also collected their uh, Brachyhippoponus bombilla. Um, and one of the things my supervisor showed us was that if you took a microphone and you open the, the cables at the way the jack is and you expose them, took off the, the insulation, tie them to a stick and put them in the water, they pick up the ticks and squeaks given off by the electromagnetic pulse of the knife fish. Um, and you can hear it played back to you as a form of sort of tick, tick, tick. And depending on the kind of sound and the frequency, you know what species is hiding there underneath all the floating plants just from listening uh, to the, the audio uh, return, which is, I think, pretty amazing. Uh, now moving into siluriforms, the largest family of fishes uh, on the planet, I think. Um, so here we have Itaglanus herberti, which is small, slender, almost like a miniature loach, it tends to crawl and creep its way through pebbles and, and, and gravel on the riverbed. Um, it's a member of the Trichometeridae family, the parasitic catfish family, and it has these dermal teeth, which are the same sort of scales that sharks have, the teeth on the outside of the body, except it uses them to uh, grip and walk across the gravelly substrate and, and hook itself into place, these odontodes. Um, and they've actually been recorded using these in order to sort of hike their way up waterfalls. They are related to the famous Candiru, the Vandelia cirrhosa from the Amazon, which also has these spikes. Unfortunately, it uses them to lock itself in place in the gills of fishes and it uh, feeds off the blood vessels there. But unfortunately, it also has been found to swim up the urea through a bath of bathers because it's attracted by the smell of urea, which fish excrete through their gills, and lock itself in place with its uh, odontodes and start to happily feed and swell. And it's, uh, there's one surgeon in Manaus, I understand, who has become the world expert on removing these from uh, unfortunate human beings. We do have a species here in the Pantanal uh, that feeds on blood, the Paravandelia oscitera, but there's never been an instance, thankfully, uh, of it uh, parasitizing humans yet. This is a family that I think many will be familiar with and, and is popular with many people here. Corridoris, and this is Corridoris Aeneus, uh, which is the most common and easily found in, in, uh, in the hobby. Um, in the Silur, in the Silubra Delta and in the Pantanal, we find it with this sort of blackish olive green coloration, uh, but also with this almost laser green, lovely uh, shimmering colors. Um, so anything from copper, bronze, rusty reds to a green sheen. We, as you saw earlier in the video, uh, in the uh, savannah stream, you find them in large groups uh, foraging over the substrate. They really like uh, aquatic worms, nematodes, and then they will spawn over dense aquatic vegetation, particularly uh, ceratophyllum, because their eggs are sticky and they adhere to the plants and they're protected within the bush of plants and harder for predators to access. So here we can see them in a savannah stream again. Uh, again, if you want to re recreate a biotope like this, very easy. Emigramus aurei, Hyphosobrachonechis, Corridorus aeneus. Some twigs, leaf litter, the bomba caroliana, uh, get some organic detritus in there, a bit of flow, and, um, and a large swarm of the, of the, uh, the corridors. And uh, you create quite an interesting dynamic uh, biotope that's perhaps quite different from uh, what is usually on offer. Another common species is Corridorus hastatus, lovely little miniature corridors. Uh, they tend to hang out in the mid water column. Uh, rather than the bottom. And again, because they have that black spot with the white tips around it, that lets them shoal alongside tetras that have the same uh, pattern and provides them not only with safety of being in the shoal, but also provides them with access to food items in the midwater column that other corridors wouldn't normally access. Um, and you do find them in large shoals sometimes, but it's difficult to find them. So here in the wet season, over beds of ceratophyllum, or hanging out in the mid-water column with some uh, serapinus that have the same black spots. Uh, and in the gloom, as soon as they swim a few feet away from you, they become quite difficult to see. Um, but this was one of my favorite moments. Uh, this was the first time I saw them in, a large num in large numbers together. It's 
really pleasing. And again, an easy biotope to recreate. Lots and lots of hornwort, some gloomy tannins, let algae run rise if you want and fill it with uh, Corydoras hastatus. They're quite easy to breed in captivity as well. We've got uh, Corydoras uh, elegans, or SPGR C elegans, um, and this is a sort of quite blunt faced little Corydora. Uh, they're quite fun and they'll come and forage alongside uh, Corydoras polystictus, which you always find there. Uh, particularly in the dry season, we encounter them over open sand beds, uh, digging and shuffling around. You can, but here you see them in the wet season, uh, swimming around with a, a bunch of garrisons that come together. Um, and they, yeah, they have a sort of blunt snout, which is, is quite, quite cute. We've got Cor Basin. Um, again, it likes to forage over areas of open sand, hunting for living invertebrates and, and digging up uh, edible uh, detritus. Um, again, spawns amongst aquatic vegetation um, and easy to catch with a panning sieve in uh, shallow habitats in the dry season, particularly where it's very muddy and silty. Um, we tend to catch lots of them and they have this lovely shining green to, uh, to dark olive coloration on the body. Alongside them, we often find Leptohoplus sternum pectorale. This is a small hoplo catfish. Um, and you can see in the sieve, which has come up with all this silt there, it's full of corridors and, and these uh, Leptohoplus sternum. Um, and they are found in sort of a few millimeters of water, rootling around in this murky, smelly mud. And they're very happy feeding on all the, uh, the macro invertebrates they find there. They have their larger cousin, which people are familiar with, which is Heplosternum littorale. Um, I've never collected these, but I photographed this one in the Salobra at night. It's sitting right in front of a, a wolf fish. Um, this fish has a huge uh, distribution across Latin America. It's famous for its nest building. There's some really good articles actually about uh, Hoplosternum nest building, building uh, nests with uh, grasses and twigs and, and using bubbles to stick it together, uh, and which the males then protect. They can breathe atmospheric air by gulping at the surface, which means they can also survive in habitats and have periods when all the other fish in the region, in the same location, have perished. Here they are sold again very commonly as bait fish for sport fishing. This is Hyptopoperma inexpectatum. It's like a sort of uh, autosynchrous on, on steroids. Um, you find they're active both day and night. During the day, we've collected them amongst. Uh, in the root networks of floating plants like Cornea crespinis along the edge of lakes and the river. And at night, if you shine a torch out on any sort of wooden logs or logs, wooden structures, branches, often the, the eye reflects back at you, this orange light, and you, you can say, oh, there's uh, an expectatum. And uh, it's easier to, to find them at night than during the day. We have Otosynclus bororo, which is not uh, a finis. Otosynclus finis is quite common in the, in the trade, but bororo less so. Um, again, particularly found amongst beds of aquatic uh, plants, such as the water hyacinths, the Iconia pacifinis, um, and occasionally seen swimming in sort of medium-sized shoals, going from one log to the next log to graze on, on biofilm that's growing over the, the surface of the wood. Getting into the armored catfish now, we've got Hippostomus gulangera, it's a big chunky loricarid, uh, likes to hide in, in gullies and, and depressions in the clay of the main riverbed, but also found underneath um, beds of floating plants. Um, and it's found across the, the Paraguay Paraná Basin, which is one of the richest areas for, for members of this family. This species grazes on plant matter and algae and biofilm. And you can see it's this sort of solid, uh, solid hefty fish. Its cousin, Hypostomus basilisco, is very attractive loricara with these well-defined chunky scales. Again, it occupies gullies and depressions in the riverbed, often alongside other Hypostomus. has this sort of rusty orange, brown, uh, red color to it. It's really nice. Um, and it will also, it's one of the members of the family that will happily eat wood, which is called uh, xylophage, where it engages in eating uh, woody material. So if, if kept in captivity, it's always good to keep them with plenty of uh, branches and logs. This is a Terrigoplictus ambrosetti, which is sort of the, the tank of the Loricarid world, um, and is the cousin of uh, the other Terrigoplictus, which is invading Florida at the moment. Um, this species we tend to find in flooded meadows, um, 
grazing on algae or rasping biofilm from, from rocks in the main river channel. Uh, it has these thick armor plates and, and spiny dorsal fin. Um, however, we often see them being eaten by caiman. And you often hear them being eaten by uh, giant river otters. You can hear them crunching uh, the body of these catfish. They seem to really like them, despite being quite difficult to eat. Tree sort of hangs around, doesn't do very much, uh, and is very tolerant to a wide range of conditions. Uh, they're very hardy, which is why it makes them you know, an invasive uh, species. We've got uh, the Rhino loricaria, lovely uh, whiptail catfish. Here we've got Rhino loricaria parva, which lie on the open sand on the riverbed. Quite difficult to pick out un unless they move. Um, but at night, if you shine a torch on the, on the sand beds, you see quite a lot of them. Then they're easy to find, but during the day, it's, it's tricky. And their cousin, Rhino loricaria aurata, which is slightly more elongated, um, short of tail filament, but longer snout. Again, at night, Shrine of Torch, you'll find them quite active, moving about across the, the substrate, grazing on biofilm and detritus, falling leaves. Um, during the day, they're very well camouflaged, as you can see in the lower photo. Until they start moving, it's really hard to find them. But once they start moving, you see how they walk on those sturdy pectoral fins and ventral fins, uh, sort of shuffling across the substrate. Um, and being camouflaged this way and, and moving in such a calm way um, means that they can forage out in the open uh, where otherwise they would, other species might be predated if they, if they were in the same position. The siluriforms continue with uh, Scoloplacidae, these are the tiny, tiny Scoloplax inclusa. They are you know, two, less than two centimeters. Um, and again, we find them in the same habitat where we find Corridoras and the Leptohoptostern, and that's a muddy, silty habitat along the bank, lots of decaying uh, vegetation, uh, which provides habitat and, and food uh, for them. And another species we find in that same habitat, this very silty, murky, fetid habitat where the aquatic plants are dying, and it's, it's, it's quite unpleasant to work in, uh, also with all the mosquitoes buzzing around you is uh, Pseudobonocephalus rugosus, which is this miniature banjo catfish, sort of two to three centimeters. Uh, it has a very widespread uh, distribution across Latin America. Um, and I've never seen them in the hobby, but they would be quite, quite fun to have as they are just miniature banjo catfish. And they look like a piece of detritus or driftwood, which is exactly what you want if you're small and vulnerable. Uh, here we've got a member of the, the wood cat family or driftwood catfish. Uh, Trachyloptrus galeatus. These are spiny, cryptic fish that like to hang out in the, in the shadowy world beneath the floating vegetation and amongst tree trunks and roots. They have incredibly sharp uh, dorsal spines and, and, and spines in the, in the ventral fins, uh, pectoral fins, which I can attest to. Um, and they will change color quite easily. As you can see, there's the one which is this brown mottled coloration, and this other which is this grayish olive coloration. Uh, and they will change that depending on, on the light uh, and the substrate in which they are found. Uh, this is Anadorus weatherlight, also known as the thorny catfish, another very spiny uh, catfish. And it can lock those spines in place. Um, so for a predator or an aquarist to try and extract them from a, a hole in a log or between rocks is very, very difficult. Um, and uh, it makes it tough for herons to, uh, or another other birds to extract them, um, although they do try. And this species will then croak and squeak uh, quite loudly when removed from the water. And scientists believe that this might, rather than be a sort of a distress call, it might be a warning to the, the bird that's about to try and swallow it, to sort of say, well, you can try and swallow me, but I have lots of spines and you will choke on me and you might die, so better let me go. Um, and it would be interesting to carry out studies on, uh, on herons and egrets and see if they did capture this kind of prey, what the rate of, of release is after hearing that, uh, that sound. There's also Platydorus armatulus, which is known to many aquarists as the humbug catfish, uh, which derives from the, the lovely pale yellow stripes along the body. Although you wouldn't want to try and uh, eat this, it's not a, not a sweet like a humbug. It has uh, sharp spines in the dorsal and pectoral fins these uh, sharp razor along the flanks. And you, they're quite social. You find them sort of bunched together inside hollow logs and lodged together um, in, in between crevices and in rocks. Um, and uh, 
again, they will lock themselves in place of their spines. It's very difficult to try and extract them. And we see them, again, they're known as talking catfish. Like our Anadoras, they will squeak and croak when handled. Again, it may be a warning to uh, pretend, potential predators to say, let me go. Um, in the literature, I've seen that they are constantly cited as being nocturnal. But as you see in the video, they are also active sort of during the day, uh, particularly along the bank in the main river channel. But they do like to go off into sort of shaded areas and hidey holes. And at night, if you go down with a torch, you'll see them out over open sand uh, foraging for the small invertebrates and crustacea. Uh, another tiny member of the, the, the Siluriform family there is Impophonis stictonus. Uh, this is one of the three barbed catfish. Uh, it's sort of semi translucent and it likes to live uh, on the bottom between leaf litter or gravel and detritus. Uh, it's very hard to find. You sort of tend to find them by accident. Um, Diversity of catfishes is, is really incredible. Um, they're found in you know, caves and in deserts on every continent except Antarctica. Um, it's estimated that one in every 20 vertebrate species is actually a catfish, which is extraordinary. And it's this diversity in terms of uh, morphology and strategies, um, for feeding and breeding and, and all the rest that have made them so successful. Fimula della mucosa, this is an attractive, uh, slender, quite active species. Um, found on both sides of the Andes uh, mountain range and in a variety of habitats, fast flowing streams, uh, lowland floodplains, swamps. Um, you'll see them foraging over leaf litter or amongst uh, rubble and, and over stones. Um, and they have those very long uh, barbels that allow them to sort of taste their environment. And they particularly enjoy uh, eating macroinvertebrates. And they're also active both day and night. Um, and in this clip here, you'll see them foraging alongside Crenicicla semifasciata and Crenicicla lipidota um, quite happily. And there may be, again, a bit of for, uh, nuclear follower relationship going on as the catfish are digging up items, the, the Crenicicla sort of jumping in and, and grabbing any exposed morsels. Um, and uh, the Crenicicla also have very sharp eyesight, so they might be keeping a wary eye, eye out for predators which the catfish, distracted as they're foraging, uh, might not notice. Pimelodus argenteus, it's another uh, of the pims. Um, it's got, a, again, a widespread distribution. Um, it's found generally in the deeper, darker parts of the, the river channel. And uh, has, again, this fantastic spine in the dorsal and pectoral fins. Um, and they lock in place. And with practice and dexterity, you can learn how to unlock them, sort of pop them out, like sort of dislocating a shoulder. Um, but usually you end up, as I learned, with quite a few injuries whilst trying to, uh, to master this process. Pimelodinus, uh, Pimelodus ornatus is one of the most beautiful fish, perhaps, that we have here. Uh, lovely emerald greens, shimmering silver colors to them, bluish, almost purple at times, depending on the light. Uh, they have a huge distribution across the north of uh, South America and are found in a variety of habitats. They tend to be more active at night. We tend to catch them uh, on rod and line with baited hooks at night. Uh, reaches about 30 centimeters and will eat absolutely anything and everything that it can. Um, and I was reading that captive specimens have um, eaten until they are unable to swim. They, will, they are so greedy. Uh, they hunt together in sort of packs, if you like, along the riverbed. And in the wet season, they will migrate in their thousands to to spawning sites. And as I have also learned, these spines can inflict a sting with a venom equivalent to that of a wasp. It's, it's not very uh, pleasant at all. This is how it is my favorite. Oh, sorry, go on, Michael. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Ty, I just wanted to give you a uh, notice on the time. We're now at two sure. hours and 25 minutes. So we may want to uh, move fine. along soon to some of the Q&A. That's all. Thank you. I will go through. Um, here we've got Pimelanus Montanero, which is one of the most uh, beautiful uh, fish, I think. Again, uh, an efficient hunter, those long whiskers allowing it to predate uh, fishes, macroinvertebrates, uh, crustaceans, mollusks along the riverbed in murky habitats. And uh, hang on. We have another. I've skipped a slide. Pseudoplatistoma curuscans, known as the Pintado. Uh, 
on, on a rainy night along the margin of the Slobada River, uh, about 20 centimeters. They grow to 166 centimeters in length and can weigh up to 100 kilos. They are massive fish. Um, as adults, they are truly impressive. Um, and we see them swimming alongside other large fish in the main river. Uh, this is my friend, uh, Thiago, who is a uh, professional sports angler and biologist here. And he provided this photo of uh, him with an adult. And in the clip on the left, you can just make out a few of them on the bottom of the river in the gloom swimming alongside Kurimba. Uh, but they hang out in the deepest parts of the water and especially where the flow is very strong. So trying to film or photograph them is really tricky. The other species that we know occurs in the Salobra because I've been able to look at a head deposited in the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro, which was collected in the 1940s from the Salobra Delta, is Zungaru Zungaru, which is known as Jaú. This is a, another massive catfish. Again, uh, Thiago uh, Taveira has provided me with a photo of himself with a fish. Thiago is one of the largest men I know, and he makes the Jaú actually look quite small. Um, but they are huge fish, and like many of the big uh, species in Brazil and across Latin America, they're under threat from overfishing, hydroelectric dams, habitat destruction, and pollution. Simbrancus madeira, this is uh, one of the, the swamp eels. Um, here they're sold in vast numbers in bait shops. They're very sort of prehistoric, monstrous looking creatures. And they can also breathe atmospheric air, as you see, some of them put their heads out of the water here. They can move from one habitat to another. They can hide out, uh, hang out uh, in mud, buried in mud and silt and last uh, for long periods of time out of the water. Um, and they've been used by humans for a very, very long time. Uh, there's evidence of them having been consumed in uh, pre-Columbian uh, archaeological sites. I'm going to try and race through the cichlids quickly so we uh, have some time for questions at the end. Achillon spatialnatus, small, uh, small cichlid, not found in large numbers, but when we did collect it, it was underneath aquatic plants, floating aquatic plants in the lakes alongside uh, in, the, in the Pantanal Delta. And they're omnivorous species eating pretty much everything and often found alongside other small to medium sized cichlids. Epistogramma combre, uh, one of the less colorful epistogramma, but uh, still quite charming, uh, found over open sand and in leaf litter in the main river channel, but also along the edges of the lakes. Um, and easiest to spot in the, in the, in the dry season. Uh, I think in the wet season, they will move more into uh, flooded vegetation. Astronautus crassipinis. So this is one of our, our Oscars, not the Amazon species, um, but they are beautiful, intelligent creatures. They're known to have, or just thought that they have an emotional intelligence akin to Labradors. Um, they will eat pretty much everything that they can, but they are particularly uh, fond of, of fruit when it's available. Uh, I've observed them in uh, the Pantanal lakes there in the Salobra. They will swim on their sides in shallow water to accompany uh, their young, um, but they will also seem to return to sunny spots and tilt from side to side. Um, and I can only assume that they are sunbathing. They seem to enjoy this. And then in this clip at the bottom, uh, a group of adults is chasing off a, a wolf fish that they've decided that they, they don't want hanging around which is uh, quite unusual behavior. Um, and that's the only time I, I've, I've recorded that. Um, yeah. Caterbrancopsis australis. This is not a species I've ever seen in the trade and it would be very difficult to maintain in captivity. It's a filter feeder. Uh, my colleagues here who tried to maintain it uh, said it's just very, very picky in terms of feeding. Um, but we see it hanging out with other cichlids such as Cichlosoma dimerus and Apidens plagiotonatus. Uh, particularly in the lake habitats. Ujokina vitata, this is another small cichlid um, and it's a bottom dwelling benthic species, eats invertebrates, edible detritus, um, and it exhibits parental care. In fact, it will actually relocate its eggs uh, in response to a predator threat or environmental change that will take them from one place and deposit them somewhere else. I've only ever collected a few in the Salobra Delta. Cichlosoma dimerus, which we mentioned earlier, uh, commonly known as Acara here in Brazil. It's the most numerous and ubiquitous uh, cichlid we have here. We find it absolutely everywhere, all times of year. Um, it's an omnivorous, hardy species. It can handle lots of different uh, environmental uh, changes um, and conditions and will eat everything. 
And it's quite charming. So they're quite curious about the, the camera here. They come up and, and check it out. Want to know what's going on? Um, has quite sharp spines on the uh, the dorsal fins and on its gill covers on the operculum. Um, and we find them in dwindling bodies of water in the dry season. Huge numbers of them, and very few other species. And it seems that many of them have terrible injuries: missing eyes, missing gills, missing fins. You know. They are caught again and again and again by uh, herons and egrets in the dwindling water, but because of the spines, they are released. And so you end up with these sort of zombie uh, cyclosoma that are barely held together, but still survive. And it's one of their strategies that means that they can last the dry season when other species can't. Um, it's easy to find them at night, night with a torch in the sh shallows of the riverbed uh, near the bank. Um, and they can be quite sluggish, almost sleepy. You can, you can scoop them up with your hand uh, if, you're, if you're quick. And we find them in the, in the lakes, residing under floating aquatic vegetation. The Crenocicla lepidota, which we talked about earlier, also known as Juani or Jacunda here, uh, found pretty much in every body of water. Um, you often see juveniles together. And is, as this clip shows in the flooded meadow, um, they will exhibit parental care in terms of trying to scare off a predator, i.e. me, who has found their young in this uh, flooded water meadow, and I'm a hundred times the size of the adults. They will come out and try and see you off, which I always think is pretty admirable. Um, they're omnivorous, they will eat anything that fits in their mouths. Um, as I said, keeping them with other fish in the aquarium, you really need to be careful. They've got these big eyes for finding prey, slender body for slipping in between roots and, and tangled networks that lets them exploit the habitat uh, as much as possible. There's quite a lot of variation in color. Um, the females get this lovely red to purple bellies when they're in, in breeding condition. The other Crenocicla, the second species we have here is Crenocicla semispaciata. It's a cigar-shaped species. Again, like Lepidota, it prefers to hang out at lower levels. It's found sort of scooting across the substrate. Um, often it sort of hops and glides. It doesn't seem to mind the present. I've seen them sort of interacting with Lepidota almost playfully uh, dancing about. Um, they will forage alongside other, other species, such as we saw earlier with Pimla della Mucosa. They will forage with other Crenocicla. Here in the top video, they're with Crenocicla vitata and Crenocicla lepidota, foraging over leaf litter and sand beds. And in the bottom video, there's uh, two adults getting, uh, getting romantic while uh, uh, Hippostomus is pretending to, to ignore what's going on. And we often find this species uh, in the, at the edge of lagoons, but also in the main river channel. So they're not as common as Crenocicla lepidota, but once you spend a bit of time in the river and know where to look, you start to see, see uh, quite a few of them. And they seem to like complex habitat, so branches, sunken leaves, sunken uh, twigs uh, that they can retreat to, but they will come and forage over open sand. And the final Crenocicla species we have is Crenocicla vitata, which is our largest species. This is a pure piscivore once it's adult. Uh, it's a large torpedo-shaped uh, fish. Um, juveniles will eat pretty much anything, but the adults will really chase after uh, other fishes. They exhibit lots of parental care. They don't like it when you get close to their young, as I've discovered. Um, they will place themselves between you and the young and, and do a lateral uh, threat display, flicking their fins at you, um, telling you, you know, back off. And if you, don't, uh, if you don't get the message, then they might come and charge at you with their, their mouth open. Um, so they're very protective of the fry, and that means a larger number of fry have a chance of becoming adults. So although, uh, Crenocicla vitata isn't very common in the in Salobra Delta. Uh, at least they do care for their, for their young and they have a good chance of surviving to adulthood. You can see here in this picture, uh, juvenile Crenocicla vitata also get engaged in the nuclear follower relationship. So here there's a quidimba disturbing the substrate and the young pike cichlid has gone in there to try and snap up any morsels that you can uh, uncover. And I've also observed them in other rivers, uh, mimicking the movements of uh, carasidium, data carasins, um, and hanging out alongside the carasins. And it may be that that lets them feed out in the open with the carasins providing sort of extra security with lots of pairs of eyes. It may also be another one of the, uh, the sort of deadly internships whereby 
Plaxic is learning the behavior of the carotidium upon which it will predate once it reaches uh, a larger size. Geom of Diophagus bolzano, this is one of the, the sort of hump head earth eaters. I've only collected one individual from the Slobra, and that was from a lake. I don't know very much about them, except that they can be quite quarrelsome with anything that looks remotely similar to them. Uh, the males are very uh, testy. And again, they are substrate sifters, uh, benthonic feeders feeding on the bottom of the lake. Mesonata festivus, this is a species that many people will know uh, as the flag cichlid. Uh, widespread distribution and some colleagues of mine who actually recorded it uh, parasites of uh, species such as Leprinus pellirici and Schizodon borelli and I've collected them in Slobra Delta almost always in uh, lake habitats and at the margins of uh, lagoons. Satanoperca papaterra, this is one of the earth eaters. Uh, it's quite a large chunky cichlid, beautiful gold coloration um, we find them particularly the big adults in small groups in the Bahias um, and then juveniles you often find over leaf litter and sand in the main river channel uh, individually or in, or in pairs and when they swim off the, the, the adults tails you know kick the substrate up and it develops this cloud which uh, covers their retreat which is quite a quite interesting way of uh, escaping your predator um, and again they're important as ecosystem engineers. They, they prevent the buildup of organic material and the development of gases or noxious materials by constantly sifting up uh, the sediment. And that material that's lifted up from the, from, the, from the bottom is now taken into the river current and distributed further downstream and made available to other, other animals and plants, either as food or as nutrients. Um, so they have an important role to play. You see, juveniles are quite. Uh, quite sweet really sort of skulking and zipping over the uh, open substrate and in the wet season when there's more vegetation you see them uh, lurking through the stands of, uh, of hornwort. Almost done on fishes. Um, the only killifish that we've collected there is Melanohiblus punctatus which is a very small little killifish. You find it in marginal vegetation uh, along the edges of, of the lagoons in very shallow water um, it's not an annual killifish, it, uh, it breeds uh, year round, uh, but when the dry season really starts to bite, it retreats into the very shallowest parts where it's, sort of, it's more mud than water, but it can hold out there until the rains return. And our final species is uh, Manai. This is one of the freshwater needlefish, um, descended from these, these marine cousins that once occupied the center of Latin America when it was an ocean. And these fish glide just beneath the surface. They have this lovely gold green coloration with a red line along the body. But if you look at them from above, it's more of a silver to olive coloration. Uh, a third of them is, is mouth, uh, full of very, very sharp teeth. And they swim very slowly towards prey, particularly small fish near the surface. And at the last minute, they lunge forward, they strike and they snap up uh, their prey. And you used to find them along the edges of the river, we find them in the uh, lagoons, we find them in the lakes, so they're pretty ubiquitous across the Slobra Delta. Uh, in captivity they're difficult to keep because they startle easily and they bang their snouts against the glass and can rupture their, their jaws. Um, they are however quite beautiful. Um, I was explaining to Michael and Natasha before that uh, the art famous archer fish, the juveniles, are known to observe the adults for a period of time. Uh, Techniques. So the velocity, the tra trajectory, the volume of water, um, in order to be more accurate. And, and juveniles that did a, a study of adults were found to be 70% more successful in their uh, predation attempts. And you often see the, uh, the, the needlefish swimming around with several, a pair of adults followed by several sub-adults or young. And I wonder whether this is a similar process that the young are doing an internship with the adults to study how to approach prey, how to uh, target their prey how to make successful strikes. And that would be something that would be quite interesting to, to conduct as a study. So finally, to finish, uh, globally, as probably many of you know, wetlands are under assault. They are being destroyed at a horrendous rate. Uh, we have less than a fifth of three industrial wetlands still in, in existence, and that's expected to collapse even further to less than one-tenth by the middle of this century. 
you can see the photo on the right. This is kind of late in the afternoon. Uh, it should still be blue sky, but the sun has turned and the sky has turned orange from the smoke of all the deliberately set fires uh, near the near the near the Salobra River. Uh, it's quite depressing to working there and, and to know that the destruction, the environmental destruction, is going on uh, right then around you. Finally, I want to thank everyone who's, who's logged in today and I want to thank uh, Michael and, and Natasha who've been great in uh, getting this uh, up and going. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about the Salobra Delta or other habitats here in Brazil or, or see any of the tanks that I've set up, um, I have a YouTube channel, Biotopia, um, that you're free to, free to go and check out. And I have an Instagram account, Biotopia Thai, where I post various videos and bits about habitat. Um, this presentation has been based on the work of a book that I'm producing, which is the, the fishes and the habitats of the Salobra Delta, uh, which I hope to publish next year at some point, possibly, let's see. Um, but uh, all the species and the habitats that you've seen here, I describe in much more detail, um, and I describe the dynamics of the Delta there. Um, and I hope to bring that and make that available to people um, because the Salobra Delta is very representative of the Pantanal in general. So understanding this particular region will help you understand the dynamics of habitat and fish populations uh, across uh, the Pantanal will be very useful perhaps for people who want to set up uh, biotope tanks. So I hope that was interesting for everyone. Uh, I hope it was useful. And um, I'm sure if anyone has questions, Michael will now step in and, and uh, direct them at me. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ty. Yes, uh, that was a fantastic. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, right. We have from uh, Franz uh, Vermeulen. Um, yeah. He says, Ty, as a foreigner, it seems almost impossible to get a permit uh, for doing research in Brazil. I am preparing mm. for the third volume of my book series and for photo documentation. I need to bring some live fishes, small numbers only, back home. In what way can I obtain such a permit, or do you think it is not possible at all? Uh, Brazilian bureaucracy being what it is, that is very tough. Um, if it's a case of photos of live specimens, the best bet would be to get in touch with um, a federal university in the region where he intends to carry his research, find out who is doing any research on, on fish, or perhaps who's researching that particular family or species. Um, and getting in right. touch with them, maybe they, researchers here will have licenses uh, to collect within certain river basins. And he could then either come out here or try and see if they would take photos for him and send them. Or it might be possible to come here, arrange, if, if you know, takes planning, um, to go on a collection with people who do have the license, the, the CISBIO license already to collect. Um, right. And, you know, that might be expensive and difficult logistically, but it might also be possible to find out who's looking into those species or who might be working in that area regionally who could take photos and, and supply them because that will be easier than trying to get a license as a foreigner to particularly right. export I'm, any specimens. So that's, uh, I'm gonna just suggest that he get in touch with you directly. Maybe you can give him some pointers who, who he could contact there, is that, sure. uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have more questions. Um, another is about uh, is from Richie Newell, which is, do you know of any smaller species of ray, sometimes known as teacups? Yeah, so you and I had this discussion before, I think. Yeah. I don't, I don't know enough about what is called teacup stingrays, <laughs> particularly to be able to advise on their, on their care. Um, but it, it depends on what you advise, think is as you know small. Even a small ray needs a large, uh, a large tank, large surface area over which to move. Needs very good filtration. Um, again, rays are quite at times of the year quite social animals. You know, so you'll need you know perhaps several of them together. Um, again, I'm not uh, a specialist in in rays. Um, I know, I think uh, Ian Fuller, who is a Corridoras man, but is also a, a Stingrays man from what I know, he might be someone to reach out to and ask about this species. Um, and uh, I know he's on Facebook, so he might, might be the guy to talk to. 
from from my own research, I mean, I found there's a there's a small disk ray. I mean, w ray with a small disk called Plesiotrichia nana, um, and it 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 may only be something like for males or 25 centimeters across. And females might be up to 40, but the I've seen them in uh, Peru in the in the um, wholesaler in a wholesaler, and they're tail is incredibly long so they have an incredibly long delicate tail which easily breaks and then gets infected um, so they actually need still I extremely large and, and then unobscured tanks that don't have rough edges or anything they could break it on uh, yeah. so that's not really a solution and then i often see um uh, Potomatrigon uh, hystrix and scobina are uh, being mentioned, but when I look up the maximum sizes, they're still fairly big and hefty. They're still, you know, up to 12 pounds or something like this in weight. Uh, so, I mean, is that really small? I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to tell. And that the very little one that with its small disc size has this massive delicate tail that, that makes it even more difficult to, to keep. So I think um, the money so we have you could keep something what's that? The money, the money and resources you'd invest in trying to keep a ray in still unsuitable conditions uh, could be invested in keeping some other fish in, in amazing conditions and showing them off beautifully. So um, yeah I agree. And also that term teacup obviously it's a trade sort of yeah. trick to make it sound like it's a little cute ray that doesn't grow big and that's not true really um there is no such thing as a teacup ray it's just a it's a trade name that's applied to any kind of small rays that people get in basically um okay there's another uh, question uh here um which is about the differentiation of species you were mentioning that some of these species are very hard to tell apart um, when you look at them. Now, so the question uh, is, um, let me just find who was the uh, questioner on this. Hold on. Uh, it was the my question. question is, <laughs> oh, it's yours. Okay. Yes. Uh, I thought you were asking for someone else. So this no, came no, no, out no. of discussion with uh, Heiko uh, and, um, uh, and the idea is, um, how do they tell each other apart? I mean, there, there's a joke, I guess, about this that, you know, we do it by the tooth count and whatnot. Do they look each other in the mouth and count the teeth to tell their species from another? Obviously not. How are they able to distinguish when there's such uh, fine distinctions in order to be able to breed and not uh, accidentally breed with the wrong species? That's an amazing question because it's one that we don't have the answer to in many cases. Um, I think, and this is why, you know, the more we understand, the more we learn, the more we understand, um, the better we, we can try and see how absolutely amazing nature is. We chatted last time about cods having accent. So cod from the South Atlantic, the males grunt at a particular frequency that the females in the North Atlantic can't understand. So they're unable to breed. And because of global warming, South Atlantic cod are moving into the territories of North Atlantic cod and the cod populations fall because no one's breeding. Um, and I right. wonder whether with small fishes in freshwater, there are things that we do not yet understand, whether that's uh, visual cues or morphological adaptations or either particular behaviors, you know, mating, dancing, uh, the way that things are flared or even using sound or maybe on chemical level, I don't know, yeah, like hormones. Yeah, Bill says, oh, I'm actually species A. Exactly. And the other one, species B, is there saying, what are you telling me? I don't, I, I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, exactly. Is he flirting? Is he angry? Is he... And, and whether that somehow <laughs> means that there's... Ah, this is very fascinating, yes. There's still ways of species avoiding. Obviously, we do in other uh, parts of nature, and even with some species, I mean, some cichlids and things. And, and cross cross hybridization of rays, for example, keeps happening. Um, right. I think also in the wild, maybe it's just yeah, there isn't. You're not forced together into a fish tank where you're looking at someone who kind of looks like they might be compatible. But let's have a go. Um, in the wild, there are enough partners that really fit the mold uh, and and respond in to the right to the cues in the correct manner that 
you're not going to go and risk it with someone else. Right. <laughs> um, so Ty, we had a couple couple other questions um, from Amit, and one of these is about uh, the bucktooth tetras and the piranhas, which okay. uh, in captivity uh, will sometimes cannibalize. Um, yeah. He wants to know, does this occur in the wild as well, I think, and also why would this tendency exist to, if they, first of all, if these fish are schooling, you know, as a group, yeah. And uh, I mean, further, I think piranhas show some kind of care of their young as well. Um, yeah. How is it, you know, to them to feed on their own their own group? And you do see examples. I saw an example of the other day, someone fed their piranhas a little less often than usual. Mm -hmm. And one of the piranhas was almost completely eaten up by the others uh, within hours. Well, that in a way answers the question. I mean, if you look at animal, the animal kingdom in general, cannibalism is normally uh, a stress response, right? So there is something wrong either in the dynamic of the availability of food or in, you know, for instance, piranhas. Piranhas are pretty ruthless. I mean, yes, they care for their young, but they can pick up a weakness very easily. And in, in you know, a large body of water, in a shoal, in a lake, in a river, when someone starts to get a bit weak, they might be taken out by another predator, a non-piranha. But they can, you know, they're not going to be immediately obvious to their, their, compa their, their comrades in the shoal. But in the confines of a tank, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide out you're constantly on display. So if you are swimming a little bit slower, if you're a little bit off, if you might perhaps have a bit of a disease, uh, everyone else is there already looking at you going, you know what, you know, if you're going to you can know where to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cer um, certainly happens with sharks, certainly happens with squid, cer certainly happens with a lot of other animals, yeah. And, 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 you know, in terms of feeding, keeping captivity, you have a, a routine, a rhythm of feeding, and then you decide, or for whatever reason, you don't complete that rhythm. You don't feed for a day or two days. That may itself be enough of a, it's not that they're hungry, just something in the routine has changed. And now there's an uneasiness in the shoal. Again, if anyone is slightly weak, that might be picked up on. Uh, there's also issues in terms of aggression. So um, there are species of fish that we know, even small tetras that in the wild, that they get along quite well, but if you put them in a tank, they tear each other to part pieces because yeah. there is nowhere for a, 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 a sub individual to escape from the, the view of the dominant and the dominant will just keep harassing them until the, the, yeah. the, the weaker individual dies. In the, in the case of piranhas it's interesting because it, when feeding in the wild they're quite democratic so um, large adults yeah. tend to go first, take a bite swim to the back of the queue, then the mediums come in, take a bite, swim to the back of the queue, and then the last one. And that, in essence, avoids cannibalism happening by accident, because in the feeding frenzy, if the small ones went in at the same time as the adults, likely someone would get nicked, someone would get bitten, blood would be in the water, yep. they would be torn apart. Um, yeah, but that's in, interesting. In the, of, in the confines of a tank, again, you don't have that ability to, yep. to, to recreate that. So um, They can't we, easily I mean, make a queue. <laughs> yeah, again, and it may be the same with the bucktooth tetras. I, I mean, I kept them at London Zoo, um, and the whole time I was there, they were well behaved, but they were not a lot of individuals in a very big tank with lots of uh, branches and, and leaves to break up lines of sight, um, just to try and keep them, you know, give, give them a space to hang out and hide away from everyone else if they needed to. Uh, we have another question uh, from Amit, which is um, now, first of all, I'm not sure what species this is uh, referring to. He's talking about something called a Jeju. Do you know this fish? Jeju is the popular Athrenus unitaniatus, the golden wolf fish that we uh, that we ah, All right. So, uh, okay, so he yeah. wants to know if there's a difference in the, uh, in the way, uh, if you were to have a species only tank, for them or for Hoplius, would those mm -hmm. habitats be different or would those biotopes be different in any way? They, they overlap a lot. Um, oh, okay. The, the, the Hoplius, like we saw in the videos, the, the, the Jeju, the golden wolfish, we found more often in the isolated ponds and streams as well. Because they have that ability to move over land, they, they will you know, end up pretty much everywhere. 
whereas hobbyists are more confined to, say, fiction and the main channel. But in terms of habitat, both of them are, am are ambush predators. They need lots of cover, um, but they and sort of often an area of subdued lighting. Um, because they're carnivorous fish as well, you need plenty of uh, decent filtration and pretty much no one else in the tank because they leave them. Um, but yeah, in terms of actual biotope, both species would require very similar uh, habitat. Great. Uh, we just had uh, one final request uh, for Natasha. Um, if you could uh, provide some links uh, to some of the uh, information that was uh, that that was in in this uh, presentation. Um, so I mean, from with that, I think we should bring this to a close. Um, I'd like to thank you very much, Ty. This is incredible information, incredibly detailed. Uh, it, it could, this kind of information allows a, a whole different level of, uh, of uh, detail uh, to our um, biotopes, our, our, our um, biotope aquariums. And also, I mean, um, what you're showing here is that there's this, just this entire underwater ecosystem with multiple niches and roles that I think a lot of people are not well aware of that there's there aren't just a lot of fish swimming around in there um, they fulfill all these roles like seed dispersal and grazers predators and and they're a food source for birds they're a food source for people there's there's so much uh, going on there just below the surface basically well yes uh, you're right yeah I want to show, to thank you also, Ty, because uh, it's uh, really very detailed, very extensive research. And I want to remind everyone that uh, Ty is going to publish his book on these regions, which is important. I would love to, to see it. <laughs> and uh, I'm particularly thankful for the notes and uh, all the written texts you um, have put on your slides and uh, the videos. The videos are very important. Uh, the most important probably visual support for the biotopers to yeah. in order to recreate the biotope correctly and uh, they are essential well, thank you so much thank you but like i said youtube and, and, and instagram i've got lots of videos on there so if people want sort of longer scenes and things they can go and check it out and if they have any special questions they should uh, sure. feel free to, to reach out to me and, and ask so okay oh thank yeah you. and of course yeah. it, um, do do uh, remember that uh, Ty is uh, has the freshwater life project for freshwater conservation. So if you think that these biotopes are valuable and should be preserved, get involved. You know, uh, check out some of these uh, NGOs uh, like the Freshwater Life Project and see what you can do to preserve the the habitats of your favorite fish, the the fish that we love to make these biotopes for. So thanks so much, Ty. Uh, you, and I, I think we can we can uh, bring this to a close now, Natasha. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And all the best to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.